a song of Yehuda Hanachri. In a small village, not far from what had once been the Czechoslovak border, I strangled an uber with a red scarf, identical to the red scarf that strangled Isadora Duncan. There were no traces, no prints, no blood. That night, I gave away the scarf to a 19-year-old brunette who first let me paint her body and then took upon herself the full weight of the expiation of my conscience, elbows downward. I do not know if I am writing this as a confession, a fable, a parable, an act of nostalgia, or an attempt at self-justification. I do not know the names of either of my victims. In Warsaw, I watched a child who did not even know his own name, wincing as he watched a falling star. It was the Star of David, falling from his mother's breast, falling as she fell, pierced by a bullet of light. Later at the graveside, I saw a tear fall from the eye of the winsome child, a single tear, falling like a nameless star. At Vilna, I saw an old man clutch his head in shame and wince at the sight of a falling city. At Bethlehem, a Catholic priest knelt and prayed that someone might help a falling man be saved. At Hiroshima, I saw a young girl picking mushrooms. At Bremen, when the dam broke, the culture and the crop were washed away, their roots rotted. At Wounded Knee, I saw a red cloud bursting. At Passchendaele, snow and ice had frozen into immortality the statues of a thousand unknown soldiers. At Calvary, a thief wondered why he had been rejected. At Smyrna, I saw a woman, her belly so swollen with malnutrition, she could have been pregnant with her own death. At Dir Yassin, a young Arab hung like a rotten apple from the branches of a dying tree. At Hamburg and at Harwich, the whores were so starved of occupation, they were offering themselves to men for nylons. At Poznan, the scarecrows had been pecked to pieces. At Masada, I rummaged in the rubble of three hundred living corpses, searching for the bodies of my wife and daughter. At Peking, I turned against the counter-revolution. At Padua, I sold my soul for gold and found my blood transmuted into lead. At Stygia, I dipped my ankle in a tub of poison. At Luxor, I saw a man pluck out his eye and hold it up before him as a sign to ward off any devils that were passing angels by. In certain parts of Africa, it is customary for the men to remove their shoes before kneeling on the sand to pray, while in other parts of Africa the men have neither shoes nor prayers, yet still they fall down on their knees under an almighty sun, stretched prostrate upon infinite sand. At Sodom, I witnessed the routing of the four kings. At Babel, the cacophony of saws and hammers rendered all speech unintelligible. At, the entire history of the world could be recorded in this manner, redeemed from dialectics, freed from didactic purpose, rescued from dry facts. The Autobiography of Man. Quite unteachable in school, of course. How could one possibly set an exam question? Yet as each individual line filtered through the bloodstream like a transfusion, as each DNA molecule became reattached to the universal whole, so each individual human creature might at last become bound one to the other, like links on an iron umbilicus, recognizing his or her own place on the ladder of permanent creation and destruction, the eternal history of man, the account of all our one and single life. Thus, I... Adam, the egoless, the first and only man, born at the age of thirty-three in the Garden of Eden. I, Adam, who rode my white horse out of Medina. I, Adam, who was crucified dead and buried but rose on the third day. I, Adam, who worked as a tailor in the village of Omdurman and married twice and fathered sons and daughters. 
I, Adam, who died of leprosy after thirty years among the swamps of Africa. I, Adam, worshipper of Ashtoreth, Isis, Zoroaster. I, Adam, who was anointed Julius Caesar, emperor of Rome. I, Adam, who was Caesar's most humble serving boy. I, Adam, who dreamed the grand and glorious dream. I, Adam, who conceived the plan. I, Adam, who ordered its execution. I, Adam, who was merely obeying the orders of my superiors. I, Adam, victim of the most appalling evil. And all of us apparently different, different bones, different flesh, different time, different place, all of us, nonetheless, the one and single man, woman, child, flesh of the same flesh, bone of the same bone, blood of the same blood, guilty and innocent of the same crime, architect and destroyer of the same renaissance and decaying cities, lover and hater of the same men, women, children, as single and unique as God. At Santa Dress, just a few miles north of La Havre, along the coat where Gide was raised, I overheard two Vichy Ubermenschnikin plotting their treason in a bar tabac, and I waited for them in the shadows of the building like Orson Welles in The Third Man, and shot both silently through the neck. At Pshishka, the entire ghetto was ordered to stand for three days and three nights, naked in the village square and thirty degrees below, whilst an Ubermenschnik major paraded up and down, selecting from time to time a woman for his lust or a victim for his fury. At Rouen, a young Catholic woman by the name of Jeanne told me of her dream of liberating France by selling the arsenal she had discovered in her basement to the Ubermensch. And I stayed with her that night, made love to her with passion, but in the morning, more for the love of poetry than the love of France, I tossed a grenade into her cellar and left her body smouldering in the blaze. And I, Adam, participated on every side, opening my fly before the frightened Jewess, opening my legs for the demented major, opening my hand grenade before the altar of St. Joan, opening my arms to embrace a newborn child, opening a grave of earth to lay a corpse to rest, opening my mouth to protest and to betray, opening my door to welcome and to expel, opening my hand to give and take. And I, Adam, have counted the grains of sand inside the hourglass, numbering them severally, one by one by one.